I was raised in a South Asian immigrant household with an extended Sikh family. At seven, I wore a toy stethoscope around my neck and told anyone who cared to listen that I was going to be a doctor. Anything short of that would be a disappointment, a shipwreck sacrifice, a waste of citizenship. At seven, I also wrote my first poem. My mom was like, that's a really cool hobby. My dad was so impressed by my writing that he typed it up, printed it out, and framed it for the entire family to see. I stopped believing in the universe the day he died. Cried so much, the ocean said, nice to meet you. Dad was my best friend, my movie critic, my cheerleader, my Google Maps before Google Maps was a thing. He was a painter, a writer, a graphic designer. He was a Sikh man with a turban. He was a refugee at the age of 11. He suffered from a severe form of rheumatoid arthritis and enclosing spondylitis. But even with his disability, he was the most encouraging person I knew. Not once did I ever hear him complain. At 17, after I had graduated from high school and was still committed to pre-med, I lost him due to a complication with a hip replacement surgery. In a way, I was selfish with him. He was mine before he was ever anyone else's. This included my little brother, who was only 10 when he passed, and my mom, who left her family in India to learn to love a complete stranger. They had completely different upbringings. My dad immigrated to Canada and then London and eventually settled in the US where he was able to attend college. My mom was born in a small village in Punjab and all she ever wanted was a way out. At 20, behind the back of her family, she responded to an ad in a newspaper for an arranged marriage to a Sikh American man, my dad. They came from different social classes, had different levels of education, and my mom didn't speak a word of English. They met once and were married right away. They eventually had kids, but growing up, mom and I weren't close. Dad was the assimilated parent. We would listen to Usher's Confessions album in the car and then go home and watch The Daily Show with Jon Stewart. Mom worked all day. And when she came home to see me leisurely watching TV, we would fight. I called her irrational. She called my sassy English a costume, described me as a tree with no roots, asked who are you as if her hands weren't the first to hold me. I wanted to reply, you were transplanted into American soil, foreign flowers do not grow here. But instead I said, if you wanted me to be more like you, you should have stayed in India. Something in her broke, and I shrugged. This is where my tongue betrayed me most. In Punjabi, the first language I called home, we didn't dare speak to our mothers this way. But English gave me permission. I used my access to education against her. She used her authority against me, and just like that, we were always on opposing teams. After dad died, I felt our bones break together. It was the first time we were ever united in anything. On nights, I cried myself to sleep. I wished she'd rush into my bedroom, and somehow, the beating of her heart against mine would heal me. But our hearts didn't beat the same. I needed my rock. She shrank to a pebble. I skipped stones with her, and we grieved into different oceans. Through all of that, writing was my only constant. I realized pretty quickly that I wasn't going to be a doctor. So after my first year of college, I switched to an English major. In my third year, I declared an emphasis in creative writing. And in my fourth year, I began to frequent an open mic night. I became a member of UCLA's first official slam team. And that's when everything changed. You know, I shared pages of myself every night. And any time I stepped on a stage, I was also stepping into my own power. When I graduated, I knew I had the audacity to be a poet, but 
I had no idea how, so I booked a one-way ticket to New York and said I'd figure it out from there. And after two months, I was able to land a job at the college board as a coordinator. So from nine to five, I worked in the financial district, and from five to nine, I worked on my poetry. About a year in, I wrote a poem called A Woman of Color's Guide to Surviving Corporate America. <laughs> right. <laughs> I was often the only brown girl in a room. And at that moment, I thought about my dad. I thought about his faith, his uncut hair, the turban he wore proudly despite the stares. I recalled a time after 9-11 that he and I went to the movies together, and a group of kids threw popcorn at the back of his head. I turned around and nearly burned a hole through their skulls, but he didn't even flinch. He knew who he was. And no one's racism, ableism, or xenophobia ever got in the way of that. The power of his nonconformity was forcing me, pushing me to discover more about who I was. And I knew I couldn't do that from behind a desk. So I walked in that following morning, and I quit. My boss gave me a high five, actually. It was great. While all of that was happening, I was actively dodging calls from my mother. Um, when I eventually got on the phone with her, she freaked out. My year lease was coming to an end, and she had me back to LA within a couple of weeks. When I got back, I was in my childhood home, looking her in the eye, saying, I want to be a full-time poet. And she didn't say, cool hobby. She looked at me in a way that she never had before without judgment, anger, or shame. We had both grown so much in the years that we spent apart, and then we decided for the first time to go to India together for six weeks, and it completely transformed our relationship. I realized that I was born of everything she buried. Freedom, sugar cane, Punjab's roar. She shared all the secrets she kept in her one-day vault and I stayed in her ache long enough to write about it. When we came back, she sat on my bed, legs curved into an infinity, and asked me to recite a poem. I thought about my dad again, this time about how I was always his daughter, about how he framed my words when I was seven, and then I thought about my mom's strangled speech, about how little credit I gave her, about how little she credited me, and then, for the first time, we sat there, our hearts beating in syncopated rhythm, and I read her this poem. It's called Good English. I was born in Little India, child of Pioneer Boulevard, where every shopkeeper on the block knew my name. For over 30 years, my family owned a store called Bombay Spices. I remember being 14, sitting behind the register, ringing up a white woman. She said, wow, you speak really good English. I smiled, took her money, <laughs> and responded, thank you. But what she meant was I am more fluent in my colonizer's tongue than my mother's. There's ache in that. My mouth is a desert of guilt, shame, privilege. But it got me into college, got me speaking this good English. I am the result of an arranged marriage, my mother's way out of a village trying to quiet her rage. When she moved here, my dad's parents feared that she would steal all the money in the cash register, leave my father, and start a life of her own. To gain their trust, she got pregnant. She was 21, living in a country that turned her name, just fear, into Jessie her accent a stubborn stain for the cleansing. She balanced ESL classes while running the shop, breastfeeding her child, and learning to drive. I am six years old when I correct her English for the first time, and she responds, thank you. I rid my mouth of mama, replace it with mom, with eye roll, with if you wanted me to be more like you, you should have stayed in India. But she didn't want me to be more like her. She wanted me to have everything that was denied to her. 
lecture halls and TED Talks, mimosas and boyfriends. She wanted me to have a choice in whom I marry, what language I speak, at what age I decide to have a child. At the end of 2015, she took me to India for the first time. Every house in the village knew her name. She, the one that got away, the prize of the people, their praise turning every room she entered into a temple. I am a continuation of my mother. I write to immortalize her sacrifices. I am the product of her defiance, the student of her hustle, proof of her survival. I don't get my anger from her, I am her anger, her amplified rage. To the woman at the register, screw your good English. Mama and I, we are our own language, something you can't wrap your tongue around even if you tried. That was the poem, I said all that. Thank you, thank you. And let me tell you, we were never on opposing teams after that. She became the rock I always needed, and in turn, I became hers. We made space for each other to exist fully. And before I knew it, being a full-time poet stopped being a dream and it became a reality, one that was 100% supported by my mother. Over the course of six months, I went from booking my first feature at a local coffee shop for 50 bucks to a $1,000 performance at UCLA. I became a National Poetry Slam finalist. I watched videos of my poetry accumulate to over a million views. Now, I travel the nation and perform my poems at different colleges and universities. And I just started my MFA in poetry, the most lucrative of the bunch. <laughs> The summer of 2010 changed everything for me. I lost my whole universe, and slowly, year after year, I've gained each star back. I learned to trust my story, to let my dad survive through me, to find sanctuary in the woman who raised me. Now I write for my community, for my hyphenated identity. I write for the child of immigrants who were told that they could only be one thing. If you told 17-year-old me that I would be standing here, a poet, with the support of my family, I wouldn't have believed you, but here I am. I am more sure of myself, more healed, and more committed to my path than ever before. I come from people who demand more for themselves. I am because my parents had the audacity to be. Thank you so much. <laughs>